Take your Bibles out. Turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter number four. Ephesians number four. I'm going to say a, a statement, and I want you to finish the statement for me. So crowd participation. All right, if you don't participate, I'm going to have to call you up to the front, and you have to do it by yourself. So everybody participate, okay? All right, crowd participation here. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... All right, now, you all knew the phrase. Now, no one really said it like you meant it because you know it's not true, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We've all heard it. But we know it isn't true. And that is a huge lie. We, now, we, we tell kids that so that, you know, oh, when someone says something mean to you, just don't let it bother you. But we know, man, words can hurt, can't they? Uh, if you've been alive for more than five minutes, you know that's true. You've been hurt. You've known the crushing weight of those words that people have said to hurt you. you you've known the uh, humiliation of words that have been flung your way to, to embarrass you. We've all also probably experienced the longing of words of affirmation and love that didn't come from somebody. Listen, we know that words do have an impact and words can hurt us. When I say that, you might have been taken back. As soon as I said words can hurt us and we've all been hurt at some point in time, you might have right then gone back to a phrase that somebody said to you. You, you might could immediately, and as soon as I say words hurt, you're like, yep. And the year was, I was this old, and it was, it was my mom or my dad, or it was that teacher. And, and so maybe you've been impacted by the words of somebody when you were a teenager or a kid, a young adult. Somebody said something, and it changed the trajectory, trajectory of your life forever. Maybe you had a parent who told you, you know, hey, don't aim so high for that type of thing, because you're not really smart enough for that. And while your desire may have been to go one direction as a kid, you've been told by your parents you weren't smart enough. And so you said, well, I, I, guess I, I guess I shouldn't go that way. I shouldn't do that. Maybe you had a teacher that said you would never amount to anything. And now rather than live the life that God has called you to live, you've just been trying to prove them wrong day after day. You see, words have impact. Now, words, of course, have the power to do harm, but that's not all. Words also have the power to heal and to encourage and to challenge and to spur forward. We, we talked about that in recent weeks with our Better Together series and how that we consider one another, we exhort one another, we are to provoke one another to love and to good works. And a lot of times that's with our words that we do that. Words are powerful. You may think back to the words of those that pushed you to be a better version of you or pushed you to excel or pushed you to follow Christ. You, you think back to the parent they told you how much they loved you and how proud they were of you. And they set the example of what a godly person could be. And you've held on to those words. You think back to the words of the teacher who said that you had so much potential and they pushed you to recognize that potential. You think back to the coach who always pushed you to keep going and never give up. You think back to the preacher who preached the gospel that day when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Words have impact. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a lie because words are powerful. And today I want to tell you words matter. The things that we say matter. James said in James chapter 3 that the tongue, though it is this small part of our body, it has a huge impact. With the tongue, it says that lives and families can be, can be uh, 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 made to burn, to be on fire. They can set relationships on fire. The tongue can set the world on fire. You, you think of just when you watch the news and somebody has is said that they said a certain word and now... People are going crazy because something was said. Words have power. James said, though the tongue is small, left unchecked, it can do much damage. James said, with the tongue we bless God and curse man. With the tongue we build up and we destroy. We praise and insult. We love and hate. We develop relationships and we destroy relationships. All with our words. Words matter. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Each one of us has that power just with our words to build up or to destroy. 
You know, I, I think back if you've ever read comic books or watched superhero movies, the, the, the one that's the hero and one that's the villain, there, there came a point in their lives where they had to make a decision. And maybe it was the day that they, they, they learned of their powers or maybe it was the day they had some sort of great loss in their life. And at that moment, they had to decide, will I use my powers? Will I use my feelings of loss for good or for evil? And of course, we, we see them, you know, Batman or Superman or, or whoever. And we, we see when they chose, I'm going to take the pain or I'm going to take the power. And I'm going to use it for good. And then we see the villains that went the other way. Listen, you and I, with our words, we can be a superhero or we can be a supervillain. We can make a decision. Am I going to do good with my words or am I going to use them to hurt, to harm and to do evil? Words matter. And each one of us have the power of the tongue that we can build up or we can destroy with. And so I want us to talk about that this morning. Talk about this idea that words matter. As we read the word of God, there are countless verses about our speech there, there are things, whether it talks about, uh, you know, whether it talks about how we uh, speak to others or how we uh, speak to ourselves, or how we tell the truth or lie. Or, I mean, there's so many different things, but we're going to focus on two verses this morning. We're going to find them in Ephesians chapter number four. We're going to look at verse 25 and verse 29. Verse 25 says this, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Just two verses this morning. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, I, as I was studying this passage, I was reminded that whenever I first arrived here, in October of 2017, for about five weeks, I preached out of Ephesians chapter four, uh, a series called Fitly Joined Together. And so we're going to go back and we're just going to focus on these two verses this morning, though. Now, Ephesians four, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus and he's, he's telling them, listen, as you receive Christ, there are some changes that will take place and that need to take place. There is the old man that you need to put away. There's the new man that you need to take up. There are some things that you've been doing you need to set aside. There are some things you haven't been doing that you need to start doing. And so he goes through this idea of what the old man did and what the new man should. And so this morning, we're not going to talk about all of the things. We're instead just going to look at our speech, the speech of the new man. As believers, we need to put off the old man, the unsaved person we used to be, and be developing into the man, woman that God would have us to be. And I, I thought of this this week. The words of the world have no place in the mouth of the believer. The words of the world have no place in the mouth of the believer. You, you see, the old man was a liar. The old man was evil. The old man sought to tear down. The old man was not concerned with spiritual things. But once Jesus Christ has saved us, we won't be perfect without sin, but we will be changing. We are a new creature, a new creation, and those old ways pass away. And again, it doesn't always happen right away. It's a process. But you know what? The moment you are saved, some things start falling away. And if you've been saved 40 years, a lot of things ought, have, ought to have fallen away. Even after you've been saved 40 years, you're not going to be perfect and without sin. But you ought to be maturing day by day, getting closer and closer to what Christ would have you to be. And so based on this passage, these two verses, Ephesians chapter 4, I want to give you four questions to ask about your speech. I want to give you four questions to ask when you're about to say something. Now, I recognize that you're not always going to be able to ask all four questions right then. If you come up to me after a service and ask me a question, I'm not necessarily going to stop with you standing there in front of me looking at me after you've asked me a question. And I'm going to stop and in my mind, just go through the questions. Now, is it, is it this? Is, because that's going to be real awkward as you're standing there looking at me like, did he hear what I said? Did he fall asleep? I mean, is he, where did he go? He's not there anymore. What's going on? And so there are these four questions, though. But here's what, what happens is sometimes you do have that time. Someone's left you a message. Someone sent you an email or a text. And you have a few minutes to respond. Ask these four questions. And what you'll find is as you make it a habit of asking these four questions in those situations where you can step back and have a minute. You're going to develop the speech that will honor God. And so that when someone's standing right in front of you, and you've got to give an answer right now. It'll be 
a yes to each of these questions already because you've developed that habit and you've submitted your tongue to the Lord. And so we're going to look at four questions. And again, when we talk about our speech, we talk about our words. I've mentioned this in different messages recently. It's not just what we say out loud with our mouth. Because you see, we live in a social media driven world now, don't we? We live in a world where if my phone rings, I'm like... Somebody's calling me. Why didn't they just text? You know, I mean, we all kind of like, hey, I, I, this is just text. It's, fi it's faster. OK, there. So our speech, our words, it's what we type with our fingers or our thumbs. It's what we say with our mouths. And so that applies in all these. So four questions that I want you to ask about anything that you're going to say. The first question. And again, all of these are found in Ephesians chapter 4, or drawn out from these verses. The first question that I want you to ask and this idea that words matter is, is it true? Is it true? Is what I'm about to say true? Paul said, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Hey, what's your relationship with the truth like? Are you pretty close or would you not know truth if it pulled up a chair and sat down next to you? I've known people like that. I remember years ago, I worked with a guy who was like that. He was the guy that it didn't matter what you had said or done. He had done it and done it better. Uh, if you said, man, I went skydiving the other day, then, then you know what? He used to be a skydive, uh, skydiving instructor. He's been hundreds of times. If you said, man, I, I, used to, I used to like to ride horseback. I hadn't done it in years. Oh, yeah, I was in the rodeo, you know, and uh, I was actually a rodeo clown. And if you said, man, you know my favorite car? It's, oh, you know, I used to own two of those. Like, you know, you ever met someone that's like that? No matter what you said, been there, done that, and then some. And no matter how good of a job you did, they had always done something better. And what happens with that kind of person whenever they, you, when you finally catch on, like, wait a second. It doesn't matter what I say. They've got a story that matches or exceeds it. You know, I don't think what they're saying is true. What do you start doing? You find yourself starting to try to avoid that person. And I don't want to hear their lies. If you are stuck in the room with them, they start talking. You immediately say, I just go ahead and discount about 80% of everything that they say. All right, because it's not true. Have you, have you ever known someone like that? Now, have you ever been someone like that? Have you ever been someone that, you know, you and the truth just really aren't that close? Listen, if you claim the name of Christ, that ought not be so. If you claim the name of Christ, you ought to, as the Apostle Paul said, speak truth with your neighbor. Now, we talked about neighbors a few weeks ago, and the idea of our neighbor is anyone who is in our family. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't speak truth to our family. We should. But when we say our neighbor, it's just kind of this idea of everybody. We ought to speak truth with everybody. Is it true? Is it something that if I say it, it is true and it's going to line up? You know, no one's going to be able to look at it and say, well, you lied. You were not being truthful. You know, we need to speak the truth in all areas of life at work. Hey, there have been times where. I've had to speak the truth in a work situation because I messed up. I, I remember years ago, I was working at Pine Lake Music Company. Uh, it's, it's been a long time ago. And I remember I had a call and, and, and this guy was just rambling on about something. I was in sales and customer service and he was rambling on and, and somebody else called that I had just got off the phone with. So I said, hey, would you mind holding on for just one second? I'm sorry. I need to, this guy's calling back. I need to, well, I switched over and talked to this guy real quick. And I came back and the guy I had put on hold, he wasn't happy. How dare you put me on hold now? He was one of these, it was a little, little elevated opinion of himself. I remember feeling that because he's like, hey, I am at First Baptist Church of so-and-so and we have five buildings and if I need something, I have to walk. And, yeah, okay, so, <laughs> you know, I don't care how big your church is. You, uh, but he was, a little, he was a little elevated of his opinion. But he then said, hey, I want you to tell your manager that I, I am unhappy about this. I said, okay, I'll do that. He goes, I don't think you will. I said, well, I, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to go as soon as I hang up the phone with you and tell him. So I had to tell the truth. I hung up the phone. I went to my boss. My boss named Robbie. I was like, Robbie, I just want to let you know. I just got off the phone with someone. And I told him the whole scenario that happened. I left out of the part about it. He was a little full of himself, if you ask me. I didn't tell that part, but I was like, hey, you know, I upset the guy. So if you get a call, this is why. Look, in a work situation, like that didn't do me any benefits. Like that didn't like, oh, well, I'm glad you came to me. You know, kind of made me look little, look small, like I didn't do my job. Hey, it doesn't matter. We have to tell the truth at work. Tell the truth to your family. You know what? They know it anyway. What's the point in lying to them? They live with you. Tell the truth to your family, your friends. Tell the truth to everybody. 
We tell the truth. Whenever someone asks you something or you, you choose to comment, you choose to say something, ask yourself, is it true? We, we, I commented about social media. Let me, let me say this about social media. Is it true is a great question to ask. Before you share something, ask, is it true? Hey, there's, this other, there's this tool that you can use. It's called Google. And generally speaking, you can check Google and find that, yeah, okay, look, the little green aliens did not actually take over the White House the other day. That was something. That was a movie, okay? You know, listen, if you're sharing something crazy on Facebook, stop and say, I wonder if this is true. And go ahead and do a little research before you share it. It's funny how many things get shared that are just blatantly uh, dishonest, but the person sharing it is like, oh, yeah, because a friend of mine told me. Yeah, but they read it from the same bad source that you did, so it's not true. Just ask, is it true? As believers, listen, everything we're being, that we're saying, it's being examined with like a magnifying glass. Hey, that person calls himself a Christian. Well, they call themselves a Christian, but the other day they said this, and I know that's not true. They lied to me. I can't trust anything they say. And when they can't trust anything you say, that includes the gospel. You, you may have lied to them because you didn't want to get in trouble, but they knew you lied. And then later you're like, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, he, he can save you from your sins. And I'm going to say, why should I believe you about that? You're a liar. You, you see, our speech is powerful. Our words matter. If we're not telling the truth, it will impact the kingdom of God. And so we need to ask, is it true now again this is something that if christ has just saved you and you had a struggle with the truth it may not turn around overnight but you need to be constantly saying god help me tell the truth help me be honest even if it's going to hurt me help me be able to stand up and say hey that wasn't right this is right help me make it right when i, I haven't been truthful it's going to be a growing process now, let me say this, just because something is true doesn't mean you have to say it. All right, just because something is true doesn't mean you have to say it. It needs to line up with the other things we're going to ask also. And here's why, why I say that. Have you ever had your wife say, honey, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> Guys, at that point, your answer is not, I don't think it's the dress. All right, that is the wrong answer. Even if you feel it's true, that is the wrong answer. Just because it is true doesn't mean you have to say it. At that point, it's a good, th a good time. What, what is one of the commercials? Uh, I forget which one, candy bar it is or whatever. At that point, just stuff the candy bar in your mouth. Like, oh, mur, mur, mur. All right. Hey, you, you, is it true is just the first question we need to ask. Is it true? But then we go on and we look at verse 29. Paul said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Words matter. So before we speak, is it true? Second, is it good? Is it good? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now that word corrupt, it means useless, worthless, bad, evil, putrid, impure, obscene. Does that describe any of your words? Does that describe any of my words? Listen, if we're a believer in Christ, it shouldn't. Now from time to time, it may. We need to confess that and forsake that. But the word corrupt... Oftentimes when we read this, we immediately think of profanity, which does fall under corrupt communication, but it's not the only type of speech that falls under corrupt communication. Not only profanity, but also, you know what? Gossip. That's corrupt communication. All right. How many times have we been guilty of gossip? That's corrupt communication. Uh, what about disrespectful words? What about cruel, uh, mean, cutting words? These are all forms of corrupt communication. And, and if you're one that allows corrupt words to flow from your mouth, those that are profane, those that are evil, those that are impure, if you allow those to flow from your mouth, what it does is it changes other people's opinions of you. As you, you know, say you're a believer, but then these words come flowing out of your mouth, other people's opinions will change. Their opinion of you will change. If someone knows you're a believer, but they hear the corrupt communication come out of your mouth, then they're going to question your faith, they're going to question your God. Your impact for God will diminish if you allow corrupt communication to pour out of your mouth. I, I was thinking about, you know, there have been times as I've seen different TV shows. Maybe it's a, a, a comedy and you see a character that you suddenly, you, you find yourself really identifying with. They're, they're humorous and just, you know, well-likable character, easy going. And you find like, wow, I can really identify with this character. But then you see that actor in something else. 
And maybe now they're playing a villain or they're playing some role where you're watching it and then they start, they start using profanity. Your opinion of the actor changes. I could identify with him in this comedic role where he was easygoing and laid back, but now he's using this profanity and it's just like every other word. And I'm like, wow, you're not who I thought you were. Now, of course, we understand they're an actor, not who I thought you were. Listen, that happens on a personal level. Hey, that person at work who you invited to church, and maybe they came and they saw you around church folks, and oh yeah, hey, good to see you. Oh, good to see you, brother. But then they heard you at work telling the jokes that you shouldn't be telling. You know what? Their opinion of you is going to change. What they think about you and your God is going to change. Not only that, their willingness to be around you will change. Hey, there have been people through the years that I just didn't have any desire to be around. Folks that I worked with and, hey, I got to be with you at work, but I'm not asking you to go out to eat with me later. I'm not asking you to come over to my house because I don't want my kids to hear what you have to say. I'm not asking you over because I don't want my wife to hear the things that you say. And there's, you have no filter. Everything you say is profane. And so there have been people that I've distanced myself from. Has anyone had to distance themselves from you because of corrupt communication? If you call yourself a believer in Christ, that ought not be the case. But sometimes it happens. A third thing that happens if we allow corrupt communication to come out of our mouth, things that other people say about you will change. You know, instead of, oh, yeah, that person, they claim to be a believer. They're a follower of Christ, they say. They're, they're a really good person. When we allow corrupt communication to take over our words, and that's all we say, then they might say, I mean... I mean, they're a pretty good person, but man, they got a mouth on them. Listen, I've seen folks on social media be like, oh, that's me, you know. That's not a compliment. Man, they got a mouth on them. That's not something that a believer in Christ should want other people to say about them. And so we see that when we allow corrupt communication to come out of our mouth, that which is uh, not good, that which is not the words that we should be saying, then other people's opinions of us will change. Their willingness to be around us will change and the things they say about us will change. But remember, my question wasn't, is it corrupt? My question is, is it good? And so what is good then? We've seen what corrupt, what is good? Good is the opposite of corrupt. It is useful. It is valuable. It is righteous, pure, and kind. Are the words that you are saying good? You see, when we allow good speech to come out of our mouths, when we speak those things that are valuable and useful and, and, and worthy of God's praise, when we allow those things to come out, it changes some things for other people. One, their opinion of you will change. You see, the same thing happens if we use corrupt. Their opinion of you will change. Maybe somebody knew you before you were a believer and they knew the language you used to use. But as a believer, you're only using that which is good. Their opinion of you will change. Man, I knew, I knew the language they used to use, but I haven't heard that in years. They've changed. Their opinion of you will change. Their willingness to be around you will change. Now, you may find some folks that distance themselves from you because you only use good speech. But for the most part, people will be more willing to be around you. Hey, I don't mind my kids being around you because I know I can trust you to say only things that are good around my kids and I don't want them to hear all that filth that you used to say or that other people say. And so uh, they will be more willing to be around you. Uh, not only that, the things they say about you will change. Instead of someone, you know, they got a mouth on them, it'll be someone like, man, I, I never hear them say anything they shouldn't. Now, for, I think I've mentioned before, I've had people, you know, most people that I've worked with over the last several years, it's just been over the phone because I, I work remotely. I work from home. And so there have been people that I haven't had opportunity to, you know, hey, I'm a pastor or even before I was a pastor, you know, oh, yeah, I go to church. I believe in Christ. All this. I didn't have those conversations with them because it was, hey, I got this order. What do you want me to do? But there were some that I would talk to periodically over time. And I can remember different ones that would apologize to me if they used profanity. Not because I had ever said, hey, don't use profanity around me, but because they noticed I didn't. There were others that I remember I was on the phone with uh, uh, two, two people in California that was a customer and my boss in Charlotte. We were, the four of us were on the phone and one of them said something. And they're like, sorry, David doesn't like it when we say stuff like that. I had never said anything to them about don't talk like that. Now my boss is on the phone. So I'm like, 
I never said that. And they're like, no, but we can tell. We can tell. You know, because I just want my boss to know, like, I have not been reprimanding customers on company time. Okay. And they're like, hey, I never said that. I said, no, but we can tell. Listen, sometimes it's not even what we say. It's what we hold back from saying. People can tell a difference. And so is it true? Is it good? Well, let's keep on. We've got two more to cover. The third thing, it says, that which is good, in verse 29, that which is good to the use of edifying. Or we, we might could say good for edifying. You know, that good to the use of. We use that term from time to time. Maybe you've seen somebody and you said they're good for nothing, okay? Uh, or, or maybe you've see, had a particular tool and you're like, well, that's usually used for that. But you know, it's also good for this. Well, that's what he's saying, good to the use of. He's saying good for, good for edifying. It's useful for edifying. So does what I'm about to say edify others that will hear it? Well, I don't know. What does edify mean? Edify means to build up. I want you to think about that. Think about the words that you usually use. Do they build up or do they tear down? As a parent, do the words that we say build up or do they tear down? Maybe you grew up in a home where you were constantly told you were a dummy. You were constantly told, like, what are you, some idiot? And, and, and that sticks with you. When even as an adult, you still hear those words when certain situations come, you still hear those words that you heard as a kid because they didn't build up. They tore down. And, and you know what? Our default setting many times as people is to tear down because what does it do? If I can tear John down, it makes me feel better about me. Like, hey, if I'm struggling in an area, but I can tear John down and maybe, yeah, he's so awful. He's this, he's that. Then maybe I feel a little bit better about myself. Sometimes that's our default setting, isn't it? To tear down. But speak only that which is good for the use of edifying. Speak only that which is good for building up. I got to tell you, tearing down is easier a lot of times, isn't it? I mean, think about if you've ever done any renovations around the house. Tearing down is easier than building up. When we did stuff around here, hey, I, I tore up carpet in just a few minutes there in the foyer. It was no big deal. I, 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 you know, took out some sinks and stuff, disconnected and threw them in a dumpster pretty quickly. It was no big deal. There, were a lot, there was a lot to demolition. There was no problem at all. Tearing up some frames, tearing up some uh, uh, floor um, trim. Hey, that was easy. That happened over a span of a few hours. And then over several weeks, we had to build back up. We had to install flooring and sheetrock and paint and do different things. You see, demo day is always a lot easier than the hours and days and weeks building up. And the same is true with our mouths, with our speech. It's a whole lot easier to tear someone down, to, to just lob that verbal grenade and walk away. And it blows up behind you and you just keep on walking like in the action movies. Just keep on walking and no problem to me. And you've left a trail of destruction with your words behind you and you just keep on walking. That's easy. That's our, our human nature, our sin nature. That's our default setting. It's easy to tear down. But Paul said, hey, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, building up. That's tough. It's sometimes hard. It takes work. Just like when we finish out a building or renovate a building, the demolishing, the demo is easy, but building up takes time. It takes effort. It takes some amount of skill. I mean, hey, if you're going to build someone up with your words, you've got to know what to say and how to say it. And you've got to know things not to say to them. And it takes some work to do that. And here's the thing, you might be coming behind someone that destroyed them with their words. And now you're trying to build up where someone else is damaged. And as a believer in Christ, listen, we have the words of life in the word of God. We have words of hope and joy and peace that we can speak into someone's life to build them up. They may have been beaten down and torn down and destroyed their whole life. And here's your opportunity. What am I going to say? Am I going to dismiss them? Am I going to tear them down? Am I going to ignore them? Or am I going to say, you know what, listen, hey, I know you've been through a lot. Let me just tell you, God loves you. God loves you and he's got a plan for you. And the first thing in his plan is that he wants you to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as, his, as your savior. Because he sent his son to die for you. Listen, hey, you can speak those words or you can destroy. You can speak words of truth, words that are good, or you can speak words that tear down. 
and that destroy. Listen, as a believer in Christ, if you call yourself a believer in Christ, it doesn't matter if you've been saved for a minute or a hundred years, you ought to be trying to build others up, trying to edify other people, lift them up and build them up. So words matter. We ask, is it true? Is it good? Does it edify? And then finally, we see, does it minister grace? Because it says there at the end, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Does it minister grace? Colossians 4, 6 is another verse that Paul talked about our speech. In that verse, he said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. We see this word grace mentioned there. And, and real quick, as an aside, and this was really more towards the is it, is it good, there's a phrase in there, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Now, I, I, I don't know about everybody, but I like salt, okay? <laughs> Nikki gives me a hard time as, as, uh, as you know, she sees me salt, and it's basically just to unscrew the cap and you know, pour the salt on there. I don't really do that bad, um, but I like salt. Now, for us, though, salt is just something to add a little flavor, right, to make it taste better. In their day, it was a bigger deal than that. And so when he said, let your speech be seasoned with salt, it had more to do with just being tasteful, although that's included. But in their day, they didn't have, you know, hey, I'll just go throw this in the freezer and it'll keep. No, salt was a preservative. Salt kept corruption at bay. Hey, our speech is supposed to be seasoned with salt. It's supposed to be a preservative. It's supposed to keep corruption at bay. We should not allow corrupt things into our speech, but instead let it be seasoned with salt. So those things that we say are keeping corruption at bay. But then that's the salt part. But what I wanted to focus on here, does it minister grace? Let your speech be always with grace. Grace. So both Ephesians 4 and Colossians 4, Paul says your speech needs to have grace. Grace, minister grace, always with grace. This word grace is the Greek word charis. And it means that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, goodwill, loving kindness, and favor. Like all those words are good, wholesome, uplifting words. Like you read them and you think joy, man. Think about joy, I, man, that, that's uplifting. Loving kindness, thankfulness, pleasure. These are great things. And, it's, and that word charis is uh, translated in other places in the New Testament as grace, favor, thanks, thank, and pleasure. Do the words that I speak minister grace to others? Do the words that I speak provide joy and loving kindness? Do they reflect thankfulness? Do they reflect goodwill towards others? What are the words that I'm saying? How are they affecting other people? You see, it's four questions, and you may think of some others, but just in these two verses, I see these four questions. Is it true? Is it honest? Is it something that when I say it, it is, it is true? Is it, is it good? Not corrupt communication, but good communication. Does it edify and build up rather than tear down? And does it minister grace? Does it provide joy and pleasure and delight, sweetness? Listen, as a Believer in Christ, again, as I said already, we have access to it, the words of eternal life. We have access to the word of God, which tells us about a joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have the word of God, which speaks of peace that passes all understanding. We have the word of God that speaks of a love like no love anyone has ever experienced apart from Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. These are the words that we as believers have, and these are the words that we ought to reflect in our speech. That doesn't mean that we walk around and the only thing we ever say is a Bible verse. You know, how are you doing today? Well, uh, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. How are you feeling? Well, I've just got peace, and peace that passes all understanding. I got joy unspeakable and full of glory. Like we don't have to answer every question with the verse, although sometimes that's a good thing. But our speech ought to at least reflect the word of God. God's word says that we ought to be speakers of truth, that we ought to be speakers of things that are not corrupt, that we ought to be edifying and that we ought to be speaking words of grace and graciousness. And so we ought to be reflecting that as believers in Christ. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, your speech ought to be different. Remember, the words of the world have no place in the mouth of the believer. And so if you and I... 
would start just using words that are true, good, edifying, and gracious. Or maybe you already do that, and so it's just a reminder to continue. Listen, speech like that will change the world around you. It can change the entire world because we hear leaders and we hear different ones, athletes and different ones that get on the TV and they spout profanity. And we're like, hey, you know, I'd love for my kid to be able to look up to them as an athlete because they're a great ball player. But man, have you heard the mouth on them? I can't let my kid watch them. You know, I, maybe some of you saw there was the uh, documentary uh, earlier in, during the pandemic, The Last Stand. It was the story of the 1998 Chicago Bulls. And Michael Jordan, man, it was really looking back. It took, I know for some of us adults, it took us back. Like LeBron James, nobody. Let me tell you about Michael Jordan, you know, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Hey, and the thing is, as I watched that, they, they did a unedited version, then they did an edited version. The edited was a little less profanity. And so I was like, man, I would like to say, hey, Ryan, Kyle, come here, watch this. Like, no, I can't, I can't let them come watch this. I mean, they could, if they saw Michael Jordan play, man, but to hear him speak, I couldn't do that. Hey, listen, as a believer, our speech should not be the speech of the world. It ought to be different. It ought to be true, good, edifying, and gracious. As I said at the beginning, we all know the harm and the pain of receiving hurtful words. Don't pass that on to others. Be the one that breaks that cycle. Maybe it was your mom and dad that said hurtful words to you. Don't say them to your kids. Break the cycle. Speak life and love into the lives of others. Speak truth and goodness. Speak words that reflect the love that God has for us. You know, the word of God checks all four of those boxes. True, good, edifying, gracious. Checks all four of those boxes. In the Word of God, it's, it shows us, again, I said it a few minutes ago, a love like none that we've ever known outside of Jesus Christ. It, Jesus gave His life, the Bible tells us, so that you and I could have salvation, so that you and I could be saved from the penalty of our sins, so that we could be reconciled and redeemed to Him. He paid the ransom. We saw this a few months ago, that reconciled and redeemed. It means that a ransom was paid to bring us to Himself. It, it, we were separated from God because of our sins. We were born into that. Because th thanks to Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 3 when they gave in to Satan's temptation and sin came into the world. They were separated from God because of their sin and we were born into that. Every one of us. It's a rare instance where you'll come up to someone that says they've never done anything wrong. And when they say it, they're lying. So there you go. They're wrong. We all know we've done things wrong. Every one of us. I mean, even the young kids, if you ask them, hey, have you ever told a lie? Yes. Hey, have you ever disobeyed mom and dad? Yes. Hey, we all have sinned from the youngest to the most senior of us. We know we have. And Jesus came to pay the penalty of that sin. Because apart from him paying that penalty, you and I are separated from God forever. I said in a recent service, you could walk out that door and die of a heart attack on our front porch. Maybe you don't even make it to the door. At that moment, you will stand before God and you will have to give an account for one question. What did you do with Jesus? And there's only two answers. I received him or I rejected him. And it doesn't matter how you phrase that answer, nothing or, well, I was waiting or I wasn't sure or, you know, I had questions or this or that. It doesn't matter how you answer that question. If you don't say, I received him, then you rejected him. And listen, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed the next breath. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. That means uh, like... Uh, that cold day, that one cold day we have a year down here, you know, uh, and you walk outside and you see your breath and you're like, whoa, it must be cold today. Hey, you see that mist come out of you, that fog come out of your breath. What, what goes, do you bottle it up and save it for another day when it's hot and you can, oh, remember that day? Remember that day it was cold? See my foggy breath? No, you can't save it, can you? Because as soon as you breathe it, it's gone. That mist, it's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And that is what life is like. Hey, listen, all of these are words we read from the Word, from the Word of God. And so uh, we have the answers to life and happiness. We have the answers to eternal life. Believer, are you using those words as your words? 
Are you speaking truth? Are you speaking good? Are you speaking that which edifies? Are you speaking that which ministers grace? Hey, the Word of God checks all of those boxes. We're looking at on Wednesday nights right now. What in the world is going on? Our world is getting darker. Our world is getting more desperate for the Word of God. They don't know it, but it's happening. 2 Timothy 3 says that the world will wax worse and worse. Men will get worse and worse in the last days as we draw near to when Jesus Christ is going to come again and he's going to receive his church to himself. It could be any day. Believers, are you pulling people towards Jesus or pushing them away with your words? Because words matter. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, which is the ultimate word, Lord. I, I thank you for that. And for each believer here, I pray that we would submit our speech, our words to you, and that we would only say those things that, that are appropriate, that are good, that are truthful, that edify others, build them up instead of tear them down, and that minister grace to other people, Lord. I pray that we would speak truth uh, of your word, and that we would share your gospel with others, that others may come to you as we draw nearer and nearer to the end. May we be a witness and a testimony to those around us. And Lord, so for your children, your, for the believers here, I pray that each of us would submit our speech to you. The tongue is a small member, but very mighty. It can burn down homes and villages and families and, and the world. Or it can build up and it can minister. I pray that as followers of Christ, we would minister with our speech. We would pause and ask, is it true, good, does it edify, does it minister grace before we speak? And then for those that maybe have not accepted Jesus, Lord, again, the, the time draws near when you'll return, whether it's a day, a week, or 15 years, we don't know. But it's close. It's closer than it ever has been. And so, Lord, if there's someone here that's never accepted Jesus, I pray that you would do your work, that we would get out of the way and allow your spirit to draw them and to woo them. I pray they would recognize that there is a love they've never experienced just waiting for them. Jesus has done everything and paid everything for their sins. They simply need to receive and pray to you and just say, I know I'm a sinner. I need a Savior and I know Jesus died to be my Savior and I receive that. I pray they might would repent today, turn from their sin and turn toward God. Turn towards you and your Son and follow your spirit, that they might begin to live for you and grow and their speech would be changed. God, I just pray that you would have your will and way in all that goes on today. In Jesus' name, amen.